efforts to possess the wonder weapon of the Great War, the Zeppelin airship, became focused in October 1917 when the German naval rigid L-49 fell exhausted in France. Unlike sister L-33, which was purposely landed at England and burned by its crew, the L-49 airshipmen had been altitude sick and could not get their ship to catch fire before Frenchmen rushed up to capture them. Commander of U.S. Air Forces in France, General William Mitchell, arrived to note the airship had been riddled with bullets by French fighter planes. Following the capture, the victors studied and disassembled the air monster. Since the U.S. had few aircraft of its own, French airshipmen were training Americans to operate their large anti-submarine non-rigid airships. Eventually, all American crews flew the large AT as well as other types. The French had even turned over command of an airship base there in 1918. Sections of the fallen Zeppelin's girders were given to the U.S. Navy representatives, and these were passed to the Aluminum Company of America. Putting some parts of the captured Zeppelin on public display, Frenchmen reverse-engineered a set of plans from the L-49 remains and shared them with the Allies. Beginning with these plans, American Fleet Airship No. 1 began new evolution under Bureau of Aeronautics Engineer Star Truscott, aided by his deputy, Charles P. Burgess, as the lightweight German design was made stronger for service at lower altitudes. The British had built more than 200 airships and also re-engineered Zeppelin designs. Their R-30 series got American attention when R-34 flew from Scotland against prevailing winds to land near Mineola, Long Island, in July 1919. R-34 had less than a ton of gasoline left upon arrival, vending corresponding hydrogen lift for a safe landing. After hundreds of hydrogen bottles were manifolded together to lift the gasoline tonnage being pumped back aboard, R-34 easily flew back to England with the wind, even after one engine conked out. The American fleet airship design evolved with greater capacity, for planned operations in the vast Pacific. The final American fleet airship design, now designated Zeppelin Rigid 1, enclosed just over 2 million cubic feet of hydrogen in 20 balloon-like cells lifting the tonnage of gasoline to power its half-dozen engines. 682 feet long, it would have a maximum diameter of 78 feet 9 inches. During and after the war, a number of airship bases had been built around America, each featuring gasoline storage, hydrogen production plants, and personnel facilities. However, they had been sized for coastal patrol non-rigids, so their typical hangars were only 250 feet long and 72 feet high, not half the size needed for a more capable rigid airship. The former Army Proving Grounds near the village of Lakehurst, New Jersey, was chosen to base the world's largest hangar. Its clear floor space was 807 feet long. Its spark-proof pavers and enclosed electrical service guarding against spilled gasoline fires. The roof was ventilated to carry away any hydrogen leaked from its plant or released by airship valves. Fire-resistant cement and asbestos cladding alternated colors for a camouflaged appearance. Massive 350-ton doors opened to a 260-foot width that was 172 feet high. Building the first rigid would create a new industry. Alcoa had been put to task developing its own version of the airship metal and delivered sheets of its 2017T4 alloy from New Kensington. Artisans had to learn how to change woodworking skills into stamping and riveting the duraluminum girders at the Naval Aircraft Factory in Philadelphia. Commander Ralph Weyerbacher of the U.S. Navy Bureau in Construction and Repair was superintendent of construction. A 13-sided radial jig was laid out on the factory floor for ring fabrication. Airship girder assemblies riveted in Philadelphia were partially disassembled, crated, and trucked over to New Jersey for erection in the new hangar. Some ring assemblies were lifted and placed before the keel was laid. Constructor Weyerbacher would oversee assembly. 
The original control car design from the captured L49 had been carefully evaluated and copied for the ZR-1. British advisors on the team had suggested that the altitude pilot station be moved to the starboard side, but the German practice of this station mounting on the port side was followed. Only the most experienced crewmen could stand watch on the control of attitude, static condition, and altitude. Over in Detroit, the Packard Motor Company was testing its new Model A1551, developing 350 horsepower from its half-ton weight. It could be assembled as either right or left turning, so it could be installed on either side of the airship. A plate was welded to the exhaust manifold so beverages and meals could be heated, a trick the Americans had learned from the Europeans during the long, freezing anti-submarine patrols in wartime non-ridges. The U.S. Army continued this tasty practice as they flew hydrogen non-ridges brought back from Europe after the war. The Zeppelin's strong keel design would spread the pinpoint tonnage of loads of gasoline tanks and water ballast bags across the 20 fabric gas bags. Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company got the contract to manufacture these lifting gas cells made by gluing thousands of bovine intestine shingles to cotton sheets. The gold beater skins were about the only non-sparking material known to retain hydrogen gas, but using them to manufacture large cells was labor intensive. Since each cow's gut only yielded about two and three quarters square feet, each cell was very expensive. Meanwhile, following two accidents that were not caused by lifting gas, an admittedly fraudulent demonstration by the U.S. Bureau of Mines fooled Congress into cutting funding for gasoline-powered flight under hydrogen. This guaranteed customers for their Texas helium plant, but while $10.8 million had been spent on the entire rigid program to date, the taxpayer then had to cough up an additional $7 million just for the helium. Besides the cost, some officers were bold enough to say this new helium policy would end flying as they knew it. Others acknowledged there was no fight in Congress and accepted the promise that helium would otherwise provide 97% of the lift of hydrogen for all airships. That promise was never kept. The entire fleet of single-engine B-ships and the entire fleet of twin-engine C-ships then setting records perfecting anti-submarine warfare at coastal stations around the country, were at once thrown away. Likewise, all the combat-tempered airships brought home from Europe were also trashed. In closing those bases, the U.S. Navy was suddenly out of the lighter-than-air anti-submarine business in order to support just one rigid. Since there was no other way to move large quantities of the Texas gas except by compressing it into drawn steel cylinders, thousands of K bottles had to be shipped, stacked so their valve tops could be manifolded into Lakehurst's new underground storage, then disconnected and shipped back to Texas again and again, 220 cubic feet per bottle. Furthermore, extensive helium purification facilities were vital to operation with the Texas gas. With no helium to spare, ZR-1's first cell was blown up with air for its test fit. Ramy cord twine, similar to balloon netting, was weaved inside the structure to discourage cell chafing on the girder structure. Acres of high thread count linen were laced to the girder structure, then varnished with airplane standard nitrate dope, which tightened it and kept most of the rain out. As the ship took shape, selected volunteers reported to Lakehurst for training. The new CO, Frank McCrary, had commanded an LTA base in Europe. This first group included three future airship captains who would later reach flag rank, Orville Anderson, Charles Rosendahl, and Herb Wiley. Their instructor was German emigre Anton Heinen, an experienced Zeppelin captain. Training was conducted in hydrogen kite balloons and hydrogen free balloons, which the Navy also entered into balloon races. Neither blimps nor zeppelins ever had any kind of landing gear, but the British had developed a spindle and cone system to secure their rigids to a strong mast. 
the Americans incorporated this English innovation into ZR-1. The keel was extended up to the bow, allowing egress to and from the mast. Noting that newer Zeppelins had improved engine cars, the ZR-1 design copied the more streamlined enclosures of the LZ-120, then being operated by the French. Each Packard had its own instrument panel, the engineman using a 10 to 1 hand crank for starting. Each car was gravity fed by a gasoline service tank to which lead could be added when necessary. Two of the cars were equipped with reversing gear. Carefully inflating the cells with the gas ferried in from Texas, it took 13,000 bottles worth to reach 85% fullness. Some 800 bottles were initially lost while looking for seepage, after which a leaky valve was replaced. Construction Superintendent Ralph Weyerbacher laid out an incremental flight test plan so the totally new airship could be put through a test program away from the public eye. Instead, the Bureau of Aeronautics invited the media to Lakehurst on the 4th of September 1923 as a dress white crew brought out the new airship for her first flight. Three local flights under McCrary's direction with Weyerbacher advising but with Anton Heinen performing actual flight commands included some guest passengers. These successes gave the Navy confidence to set aside the incremental step test plan and send the ship off to St. Louis where air races had been held for almost 20 years, well before the airplane was perfected. There was no budget to send helium to Missouri. The crew tried three times to drive the light airship down into the hands of the Army-Navy ground crew. Finally, a few hundred bottles worth was vented and the fourth attempt was successful. The crew was fed a hearty breakfast as ZR-1 thrilled thousands of spectators, completely stealing the show. Bureau of Aeronautics Chief Rear Admiral William Moffat joined McCrary and crew for the return flight. En route, Lieutenant Ronald Mayer discovered some girder sections in the fin had buckled. Designer C.P. Burgess, who was aboard monitoring strain gauge equipment, noted the fins would have to be strengthened one day. To land back at Lakehurst compensating for consumed fuel tonnage, ZR-1 was driven to 6,000 feet which opened over pressure valves to vent all cells equally, achieving landing on the first attempt. Confident of the new ship, Secretary of the Navy Edwin Denby and family were invited to Lakehurst. On the 10th of October, Marion Denby christened ZR-1 the USS Shenandoah, said to mean Daughter of the Stars. The dignitaries and some crew members' wives were taken aloft for a short local flight as reporters were told the new airship would soon be flying to the Arctic. Wealthy American Lincoln Ellsworth was willing to sponsor a flight to the North Pole. To partially address the need to vent helium to land, engineers constructed exhaust cooling radiators to recover water weight produced by gasoline consumption. First installed on engine car one, the system's weight further reduced payload and its aerodynamic drag was significant. On Navy Day, a flight took ZR-1 over the Shenandoah Valley as the new system was tested. To accomplish the promised polar flight, the airship would have to learn to operate without a hangar for remote bases. The nation's first mooring mast, a 160-foot tall elevator-equipped tower, had been constructed at Lakehurst. Its six-sided base house contained powerful winches, lifting gas piping and pumps to move gasoline and water ballast up to the top by remote control. Masting technique was not in Zeppelin experience, however, and Anton Heinen's planned method did not work. When British methods were used, ZR-1 was finally masted on November 5th. On the 20th of November, ZR-1 went up to New England, which became her last flight of the year as she was damaged trying to get her back in the hangar against a strong crosswind. Preparations for the Arctic trip continued in earnest. Two fleet oilers, the Rampo and the Patoka, were to be converted to support the airship with mooring masts on their stern. For the trip, 
Weyerbacher and Heinen proposed a return to full efficiency under hydrogen. Secretary Denby, already named in the Teapot Dome scandal, wasn't about to fight Congress and vetoed any hope of returning to full airship performance. There was talk about removing the 6th Packard and streamlining the control car more like the newer Zeppelins. Meanwhile, further experience on the mast was needed to train crews for the Arctic deployment. A single watch maintenance crew was on board the mast airship on the 16th of January, 1924. A worsening storm rose to strike and damage the vertical fins, twisting the airship until the mooring fitting was torn from the bow, ripping two forward helium cells. Quickly dumping ballast and taking to the air, the Army-Navy crew under Anton Heinen got her under control and rode the gusts like a free balloon. As the storm passed, the hero crew carefully nursed the badly damaged airship to landing, then docking in Hangar 1. The polar flight was now out of the question and the Rampo's conversion was canceled. Lincoln Ellsworth instead looked to the Italians and later sponsored a much smaller, semi-rigid airship christened the Norgay. Umberto Nobili first commanded the 4,500-mile journey from Italy to Spitsbergen, and Norway. At a base not far from the site where American Walter Wellman had launched his first attempt to reach the pole by airship in 1906, the Norgay was gassed up and launched with Norwegian explorer Roald Amundsen on board. The multinational team dropped flags at the North Pole and went on to fly all the way across the top of the world. Following a safe landing near Teller, Alaska, Venninger Hydrogen, the ship was disassembled for shipment back to Italy. Back in Hangar 1, the badly damaged ZR-1 fore and aft structures were being rebuilt and strengthened deleting the bow numbers in the process. The sixth engine was removed, its metal car replaced with a wooden enclosure to house a radio compass and the new long-range communications radio, as well as a two-burner stove. Anton Heinen had been praised for his saving the damaged ship, but the Navy returned the civilian to his instructor role. Likewise, constructor Weyerbacher was sent back to Philadelphia McCrary was relieved by Lieutenant Commander Zachary Lansdowne, who had flown combat missions in European airships and had experience on British rigids. Zach had crossed the Atlantic in the British R-34 five years earlier. The Army continued to be part of ZR-1 operations, assuming they were to have their own rigid airship one day. The Army built its hangar for rigids in Illinois that was 810 feet long and 170 feet high. They also constructed an ultramounted mooring mast 175 feet tall. Shenandoah was back on the mast while the only blimp left, the J-1, joined hydrogen balloons and daredevil airplanes to delight thousands at Lakers open house on the last day of May 1924. The helium situation worsened when the gasometer roof jammed and more than 2,000 bottles worth were lost out the bottom seal. Making the best of the difficult situation, Lansdowne perfected a new technique of using all the available helium to fill the ship at night, then masting until the morning sun's heat would allow more gasoline to be lifted and flown. Of course, no one expected wartime airship operation to be limited to sunny days, but the crew and many in the Navy longed for exercises with the fleet, even if the airship could not have full performance. In June, Shenandoah carried loudspeakers to broadcast President Coolidge's address over Philadelphia, and in July, a flight over New York was extended when the weather complicated landing. On other local flights, ZR-1 provided a platform for parachute jumpers from the Lakers-based Riggers School. Lakers engineers had completed water recovery condensers for each of the engine cars, but Skipper Lansdowne, already disappointed to find just three condensers, had reduced cruising speed from 42 to 36 knots, elected to save further weight and drag by not installing them on the three after cars. Finally in August, the former fleet oiler USS Potoka was ready to receive its airship. 
ZR-1 took all the available helium and as much gasoline as it would lift with superheat and headed for Rhode Island. With designated mooring officer Rosendahl aboard the oiler, Shenandoah dropped her mooring cable to the Potoka's gig and was winched onto the mast, the first such operation in aeronautic history. Although the airship's cone locking plungers wouldn't align with the cone and ballast water lines were found to have incompatible fittings, these problems were overcome and the airship remained on the mast for the night and into the next day. Crews found her much easier to manage at sea than while on the Lakers high mast. Later in August, with the delivery of some 1,500 bottles of helium to Lakers, the airship was filled to about 91% and was at last sent out for a fleet scouting exercise. In spite of thunderstorms and winds, Shenandoah located the battleship New York and reported in by radio. In October, the Shenandoah embarked on her most ambitious mission to crisscross the country. With the National Geographic team on board, she left the Lake Earth's mast with superheat and masted at Fort Worth to replenish helium and gasoline. Mail was carried and dropped at certain locations. Although wartime zeppelins routinely vented hydrogen to fly above 12,000 feet, helium's lower pressure height kept ZR-1 weaving through mountain passes to land at San Diego's North Island, where she was slightly damaged by the inexperienced ground crew. Chief of the Bureau of Aeronautics, Rear Admiral Moffat, was along for the trip. His flag quarters consisted of a hammock. Repaired and gassed up, she passed over fleet units before masting to thrill crowds at Fort Lewis, Washington. Back at Lakers, the long-awaited Zeppelin LZ-126 had set a distance record flying non-stop from Germany, consuming most of her gasoline tonnage and venting quite a lot of her hydrogen to settle gently into her new owner's hands. Redesignated ZR-3, she was propped up and suspended so her remaining hydrogen could be vented by the 18th of October. When Shenandoah returned via San Diego and Fort Worth, she had completed the longest mission she ever made and was berthed alongside. The journey had consumed 2,900 bottles of Texas helium. In spite of promises made, after the $7 million, there was simply not enough helium. The single blimp retained for training purposes, the J-1, had to be trashed to save its helium. ZR-1 was then propped up and suspended as well, so her remaining helium and what was left at the station could inflate the ZR-3. ZR-3 took the helium to Washington, but after several embarrassing failed attempts, more than 300 bottles worth had to be vented for her to be driven down to the ground handlers. There, for the only time in rigid airship history, an American president would briefly climb aboard. Grace Coolidge christened her USS Los Angeles, and the ship carried the First Lady's image as her sponsor mother. Returning to Lakehurst, ZR-3 had to valve helium for more than six full minutes to land. Los Angeles' time with the helium was at first devoted to crew training before her German builders had to return to Europe. The ship then made record-setting flights to moor on Patoka, all the way out in Bermuda, and also far south to Puerto Rico. Considerable resources would be expended to overhaul and repair the German gas cells, but when finished, they leaked helium at an even greater rate. By June of 1925, her leaky cells and two failed engines would layer up for overhaul, favoring returning the helium to Shenandoah. So once again, both crews worked more than a week to erect platforms to support engine and control cars, install propping timbers and dunnage along the keels, and to loosen the outer covers for bridle installation to suspend the rings from the hangar. The helium policy exacerbated the challenges of these pioneers long hated by competitors for scarce Navy resources as they were lampooned in the nation's media. The New York Herald wrote, For war service, the gas bag is to the airplane as the circus fat man is to Jack Dempsey. While Shenandoah's cells seeped only about 680 bottles per month, Skipper Lansdowne, after removing several valves and connecting trunks, sought to conserve more helium by ordering covers installed on many of her more leaky overpressure valves. When these covers were then left in place during flight, 
Zach argued that in the event of a rapid altitude increase, the altitude pilot could open maneuvering valves and the keel watch could quickly remove the covers. Anton Heinen later stated that this was like operating a steam boiler with the safety valves tied off, but the Bureau of Aeronautics approved the changes. Finally getting another turn with the helium, Shenandoah flew up to Bar Harbor, Maine, mooring to Patoka in view of the 4th of July Governor's Conference. Several governors were given a two-hour flight around the city and nearby Bangor. That deployment was followed by senior leadership finally assigning ZR-1 actual fleet work. She would make flights to calibrate a radio compass and to test a sea anchor, which showed great promise. Shenandoah flew with a new aft winch to tow a target sleeve, eventually providing target practice for the battleship USS Texas of the scouting fleet. In a practice search, the Texas was first obscured in fog, but Shenandoah located the vessel before she could get her seaplanes over the side. Practicing against airplane attack, Lansdowne proposed armament for the airship beyond the machine gun mounts and the control car. He suggested the airship could also carry and drop off its own Vought OU-1, although this was only proven later on sister ship Los Angeles. Chief of Naval Operations Edward Eberly was responding to politicians' requests when he ordered Lansdowne to plan a mission to overfly several Midwest states holding fairs in late August and early September. Lansdowne had the ship take on superheat to lift gasoline until the afternoon of September 2nd, casting off with the intention of reaching Scott Field in Illinois. Headwind slowed her progress as lead was mixed in the gasoline for higher power settings. The weather deteriorated over Ohio into the wee hours of the next morning. Since a storm cannot chase an airship, their meeting is at the operator's discretion. However, once overwhelmed, operators can instead choose to free balloon, as CR-1 had when torn off the high mast. Caught in a violent updraft, Shenandoah rose at an unprecedented 1,000 feet a minute as the crew rushed to rip open the helium valve covers they could reach. Momentarily stabilized by pitching nose down, the acute angle killed two engines. Again rising rapidly past pressure height, the airship reached more than 6,000 feet when wires snapped and girders were heard collapsing. Then descending rapidly, ballast was dropped as crewmen observed several cells cupped and deflating. Another updraft struck the bow, pushing the ship up at some 30 degrees, likely stalling the rest of the gravity-fed carburetor gasoline motors. The damaged structure tore open at frame 125, one man falling to his death. The numerous breaks in the fuel system soaked another man in gasoline, but since there was no electrical power, he and the airship were spared a gasoline conflagration. The control car twisted off and fell, carrying eight more to their doom. Another brake lost the two forward engine cars and with them four more men. Those heavy sections slammed down on either end of farmer Andy Gamery's cornfield. His front porch would later serve as a makeshift morgue. The stern drifted further on to break through trees on the Neiswanger farm near Ava. Twenty-two crewmen hung on to safety as the stern came to rest down the hillside. More than a hundred feet of the bow remained buoyant and carried seven crewmen on an hour's ride through 10,000 feet and two miles. Lieutenant Rosendahl directed the men to slash cells as they dropped lines to catch in some hillside trees. Alert farmer Ernest Nichols tied a rope to a branch and provided Rosendahl a shotgun to deflate the remaining cells. Locals comforted the 29 survivors, but word of the crash spread to the nearby county fair. The sites were quickly flooded with folks who never conceived of such a thing as a crash investigation. Hundreds started helping themselves to whatever they could cart away from what must have seemed like some kind of out-of-this-world junkyard.
sailed along. Each man was at his station. Each heart was true and strong. They started for St. Louis as they turned into night with not a thought of danger. In the media circus that followed, Anton Heinen blamed the helium policy for the loss of 14 lives. When Heinen told the newspapers he could have flown ZR-3 under hydrogen into the same storm with no ill effects, he never flew on a Navy airship again. Investigators declined to rule on the valve removal, first stating, The final destruction of the ship was due primarily to large unbalanced external aerodynamic forces arising from high-velocity air currents. Fifteen years later, during decommissioning, a purposely overpressurized ZR-3 cell broke her girder structure. Rosendahl would write, Investigation reveals that the removal of certain helium safety valves may have permitted excessive helium pressure to crush part of the structure. To this day, the government has never apologized for its powered flight helium policy which forced its airmen into making dangerous choices and crippled a promising technology. Down goes the sun, dim grows the light, long day is over, now falls the night. Fade away in the soft 